So <clears throat> we will talk today about the abstract concept of moduli and moduli space. And I want to start with a historical, uh, historical view how these things evolved. And they took essentially one century to be shaped in a precise form. And uh, people were really struggling with the precise concept. So the main person to start with was Bernhard Riemann. Uh, so I would, let me recall what is the problem. So we given a class of objects and an equivalence relation Let me call this class maybe P. So I will formulate it at the beginning in an intuitive way, and later on it will become more precise. So given such an equivalence relation, uh, find parameters. And now I will use a word which is not really well defined, modulate. And this means govern all equivalence classes. So at the beginning of the problem, people were just thinking of parameters, invariants, and were not talking of spaces. Okay? This will appear in, in, in Riemann very explicitly. Okay? So for instance, you take a couple of equations to the typical instance. <clears throat> you take polynomial equations. Up to rational substitutions. of the variables. So let me specify. When you take, let's say, a polynomial equation in two variables, you may substitute x and y by a rational function in x and y. And also, you substitute y, and you get a new one. But the geometric object behind is up to what is called by rational equivalence the same. So Riemann asked. How can, you, how can you find parameters which, in some sense, give you all these equations up to the substitution of the variables? Okay. So in, let me recall three examples. The first one will be conics in P2. You can take them over the reals okay, in the projective plane. So these are quadratic equations. And that's an easy case. It was known uh, classically. If you have a quadratic equation, that's already something you learn in high school. You can always reduce it by rational substitution of the variables to a normal form of circle. So of course, when you take quadratic equations, you are not here, you're not allowed to take degenerate equations. You take something which will define a smooth conic, OK, non-degenerate. So in this case, the problem does not appear because you just have one element in your moduli space moduli space is just a point. Okay, That's not interesting geometrically. And we already looked at the second example, which were elliptic curves. Again, in P2, now maybe over any field. And here, 
when we talk about elliptic curves, we usually think of them also as a group, so we have a neutral element. But we could also think of them as Riemann surfaces. So these are smooth, let me do it over the complex numbers, smooth complex curves of genus 1. And it's also the same as Riemann surfaces. So Riemann surface is a two-dimensional compact real manifold. And by the theory of uh, Riemann surfaces, one knows that these are isomorphic to complex curves of genus 1. And here the curves are algebraic. There's a theorem that whenever you have a, a projective or a compact uh, two-dimensional real surface, then this is essentially an algebraic curve in P2. Okay. And we have already seen that the parameter will be just parameter. There's just one. And this could be, it's not unique, e.g. the J invariant. Okay. Now, if you take the J invariant and if you vary the J invariant, the natural question is, how do the elliptic curves change? Do they change in a continuous way? OK. So this would be here, this would be the algebraic context. But you could also take just any Riemann surfaces, so any Riemann surfaces. of genus G, okay. so that's <clears throat> a complex curve, a smooth complex curve. But now you take it as an analytic object, analytic complex compact curve. And here already, it's much more difficult to find the modular space. So this will give rise to something which is called mg. Okay? And the construction of mg, or the, the properties of the existence and the properties of such a space, they took essentially one century. So this starts with Riemann, continues with Klein and with Teichmüller, then Grotendieck, and eventually Mumford giving the complete answer. Okay? So what does the word mod, modulus, moduli mean? Maybe I can write this here. So in, in Latin, we have the word modus. And modus will mean type or measure or size. So it's it's not a precise translation. And modulus is a diminutive of modus. Okay. And uh, it has, though it is a, a diminutive, it has about the same meaning. And again, you could see it as the size of something or also, in, mu in music, you have the concept of modulus. Okay. So that's the uh, Latin, of course. I tried to find more interpretations, but this was not so obvious. Okay. So let me now go to Riemann. So. Something like one, maybe one week ago, I was checking again the literature, and I found a, a very nice article. I will send you the reference. Actually, I can send you the PDF because it is online.
So, this is an article by somebody called G. And I this is a lady, the story of Riemann of moduli. This is an, an expository article, and it's really beautiful to read. Many, many informations, many excerpts from email correspondence, from letters, from unpublished papers. So I will give you a kind of summary of this this text, and we start with Riemann. So Riemann was the one who coined the word modulus. And he called it moduln in German. At that time, everything, all the German mathematicians wrote in German. And this appears on page 135 for the first time in mathematics. And the paper, which is one of his most famous paper, is Theorie der Abelschen Funktionen. And this was in the Journal of Reine and Angewandte Mathematik, number 41. You can find it online, 1857 page 115 up to 155. So I looked at this paper. It's not easy to read because the terminology is completely different from ours. And you have always to invent a little bit what he could mean. But it was a very, very influential paper. Okay? This is kind of the, the beginning of an avalanche of development in mathematics. And in section 12, he comes to the problem of classifying, classification. Now, at that time, of course, he did not call it Riemann surfaces. Nowadays, we call it Riemann surfaces. But it's, you don't need to know what the Riemann surface is. It's, it's the following. So. He looks at polynomial equation as before. Polynomial, or maybe even analytic, but let's keep it equations. In two variables, f x y equals 0. Of course, he has a different notation, but This is, sorry, I have to clean a little bit here. Polynomial or analytic equation. Fxy equals 0. And what is the equivalence relation? So. <clears throat> is birational correspondence. And this means that you take phi and psi. Now we are over the complex numbers. So these are rational functions in x and y. And you see that gxy is equivalent to fxy, if and only if. You can write g x y as f of phi of x y psi of x y. 
But uh, of course, this should be an equivalence relation, so it should be reflexive and symmetric. So what you want is that uh, phi psi the pair is invertible. Okay, as a, a map from P2 to P2. So you can express also f in terms of g. Okay. Then he is talking about uh, branched coverings and ramification points. We don't need this here. Uh, so he doesn't use the the name equivalence class. He just says this is a classes. Oh, you cannot read here. I have to, to clean. So looking at these equations up to birational correspondence, birational equivalences, is called class by Riemann. And then he asks, are there parameters or are there numbers or constants which describe uniquely the classes? So what Riemann calls Klasse in German will be the equivalence class of such polynomials, of such equations. Okay. Now, he already had the concept that the parameters, so asks for parameters. And he is also asking that these vary continuously, varying continuously. Now, it depends on the genus of the curve defined by f and g. And he makes some uh, arguments to compute the number of parameters. He is not talking about any space or moduli space, just the number of parameters. So the number of parameters. So there is some reasoning, but it's not really rigorous. Yeah? It's more like a guessing or looking at many examples. So. <clears throat> If the genus G is 1, then this number is 1. And if the genus G is at least 2, then this number is 3G minus 3. So this is a magic number. So you have to, the formula does not apply for G equals 1. Genus 1 is different. but this 3g minus 3 appears in many later papers, but nobody is really proving it. But everybody is getting the same result. Okay? And it took quite a while. Actually, it took uh, up to Oswald Teichmüller to give a rigorous proof to define what is the number of parameters and to prove that this is the correct answer. Okay. So. This notion of equivalence seems to be the first occurrence, and it was Riemann who was looking at it. Okay. So this was in 1857. Now, even though this paper was very influential, people had problems to, to grasp the contents of this section 12 and the section 13. And then came Felix Klein. This was in 1881. And he wanted to promote Riemann's work, Riemann's idea in this context. And he wrote a whole book on Riemann theory. So 
of algebraic functions. This was in 1881. So I looked a little bit at this book. Of course, I did not read everything. It's much harder to read than Riemann. So in some sense, it's not a promotion. Uh, the language of Klein is, is hard to, to follow. Okay? But there is already an idea behind that the number of parameters should correspond to a dimension of dimension of moduli space. But of course, there was no concept of moduli space. Yeah? Even analytic manifolds were not uh, established at that time. Okay? But there was already kind of idea that the number of parameters should depend on the dimension. Now, there are very intriguing, intriguing uh, situations where the number of parameters is cheating. It could be, and this is already remarked by Klein, that often more parameters are needed But they have algebraic relations. So we had this, I think, two weeks ago or three weeks ago when we discussed the dodecahedral singularity. So if you take g in SU2C, the Finite group, finite subgroup of symmetries of the dodecahedron, which was kind of Klein's favorite example. Then, if you take now the invariant ring, C, X, Y, G, this is now, of course, the modern language, the invariant ring. So this would be the algebraic counterpart of the moduli space. You associate to the moduli space a ring, a finitely general complex algebra, which is the invariant ring. And I think I have already mentioned that this is UVW. This has three generators. And these generators, they correspond precisely to the parameters we were talking before. But here, they satisfy an algebraic relation, which is u squared plus v cubed plus w5 equals 0. Okay. So this means that the moduli space is singular, okay. which was, of course, in, in Riemann's times, uh, completely out of, of thinking. Okay. So my reading of Klein was not very helpful. The, the article of G is much more precise and uh, gives much more information. And uh, of course, there were many other people involved, but I only talk about the most important ones. So the next big step was done by Teichmüller. So Teichmüller was the first one to define rigorously what is a fine moduli space. But he did it in the analytic setting, analytic context. So again, he was looking at Riemann surfaces. Yeah. Riemann 
surfaces of genus G. So as an analytic object, so the equivalence class are biholomorphic maps. Biholomorphic maps. And he realizes the following that so he finds something to what he would call MG. This is a set of isomorphism classes, if you want. He realizes that this is not well well behaved. Okay? And the reason is that there are too many, whenever you have such a Riemann surface, you have automorphisms. And these automorphisms, and this is a topic which appears again and again in the literature, the automorphisms you have on the objects you want to classify, they cause problems when you try to find the moduli space. So <clears throat> the, the basic question is, even if you have a a candidate for the set in the analytic category, the question is, is this an analytic manifold, a complex analytic manifold? And if it is, is the analytic structure unique? If yes, is its structure unique. It could be that as a set, you have always the same set, but there could be different analytic structures defining it as a manifold. Okay. So the paper of Teichmüller is called uh, Veränderliche Riemannschaftflächen. So in German, veränderliche means variable. But the meaning here is parameter. OK. So Teichmüller comments on this count here. And he says that uh, Riemann was correct in the answer, but was not correct in the proof, or not complete in the proof. Okay. So Teichmüller is the first one who thinks of the of the moduli as a space. First to consider parameters in a space. Okay. So this paper is from nineteen forty four. So almost a century after, after Riemann. And still in this year, he defines what an analytic manifold is. So the concept of analytic manifold was not very familiar at that time. Okay? So you have to imagine people are just working with equations and variables, but the general framework did not exist. Okay? So <clears throat> he recalls, so he says, let us recall what an analytic manifold is. Okay. So the first thing he does, he is talking about topology. And he realizes, as other for before him did, that it's it was <coughs> that there is a, an intrinsic problem to f define a space whose points parameterize your equivalence classes okay? due to the automorphisms. And what he does is So he 
<clears throat> he must have been really a genius because he defines something which he calls topological determination. And is nowadays also known as to rigidify your moduli problem. And how is this done? I repeat, he is working transcendentally in the, for, with analytic manifolds. So this includes, of course, looking at them as topological spaces. He, he adds some markings on the Riemann surfaces. Now, these markings are not the same as our marked points, which we will consider later on, on our stable curves. These markings have a different meaning, and they have to do with the homotopy type of your surface. So these are kind of homotopy prescriptions on the surface. So it's an extra information. And he is classifying now more complicated objects, so the equivalence classes are smaller. Okay. And adding this additional information, uh, he will get what is called nowadays a Teichmüller space. Which is a concept of differential geometry, or topology if you want, Tg. And then he proves that this Teichmüller space has the good properties, so this will be a manifold. And uh, if you forget, again, the markings, you get a map Tg to Mg, which will appear as a quotient with respect to some other equivalence relation. Okay. So inside here, uh, you still have a problem to des describe what is the geometry, but the Teichmüller space, adding these markings, works perfectly well. So he, Teichmüller, is, is kind of avant-garde because he already defines exactly what is an analytic family, defines analytic, as we will do in the second half today, defines analytic family of analytic manifolds. And not only this, he also invents the concept of fine moduli space. Invents the concept of fine moduli spaces. I have already talked about fine moduli spaces at the beginning. I will come back to this after the break. So this was 1944 in the analytic context. He does not talk about coarse moduli spaces. No coarse moduli spaces appeared. That's later. Okay. So adding these markings, he will find the natural analytic structure on these Teichmüller spaces. And he is well aware that these markings eliminate the automorphisms of the Riemann surface. And in this way, you get a nice classifying space. Okay. So he called these markings topological determination. That's very nicely explained in the paper of G. Okay. Now, this was the analytic part, Riemann surfaces. And you can think of Riemann surfaces essentially as polynomials in two variables. And uh, now comes the algebraic part. The algebraic part was 
initiated by Grothendieck. So people realize that in the algebraic setting, so when you don't allow holomorphic maps but only algebraic or polynomial maps, things become much more complicated. And uh, Grothendieck was, of course, aware of Teichmiller, Teichmiller's work. But he did not succeed. He did not succeed to construct Mg as an algebraic variety. So there is a, a nice story behind. Let me let me come to Grothendieck. And this was in the Seminaire Carton in 1960-61. So Grothendieck was 33. So Grothendieck is 1928 until 2014. So he was 33 when he did this. So he did the algebraic setting. But he admits in letters to Serre and also then later to Mumford that he does not really see how to construct this MG because of the automorphisms. Okay. So of course, whenever Gordon Dick approaches a problem, he first formalizes it. Formalizes the problem using categories and functors. But still get stuck in the construction of MG. So I repeat, MG is a set of isomorphism classes of complex curves, smooth complex curves of genus G get stuck in the construction of mg due to automorphisms. So it's very interesting to see that Grothendieck is not sure if the automorphisms which occur on these Riemann surfaces are the unique obstruction to construct mg. He suspects that these are the problems, but he is not yet sure. Okay. OK, so what he does is already he gives the definition of stable curves, defines stable curves. And stable curves for small genuses adding marked points. We will come to the definition again a little bit later. So he also tries to add to add structure to his objects in order to make them rigid. Okay. And at that time, so this was in Paris, Mumford appeared. So in 61, Mumford was just 24. So he is born in 1937. And it was Mumford who solved the problem in 1965. Okay. Solves problem in 1965 in his famous book, GIT, Geometric Invariant Theory. And there's a small anecdote that, of course, Grothendieck realized that Mumford's theory uh, will give a construction of Mg, but uh, 
I mean, he is the older one, and uh, of course, the dominant person at that time in France, uh, and probably in whole algebraic geometry over the world. So he credits Mumford, but he writes to him as follows in 1961. Maybe I just read it. So recall, somebody who is 31 writes to somebody who is 24. Don't know how old you are, but so it seems Grotendieck to, to Mumford. It seems to me that because of your lack of some technical background on schemata, some proofs are rather awkward and unnatural. And the statements you give not as simple and as strong as they should be. So that's a, a harsh critique, no? It seems to me that because of your lack of some technical background on schemata. So I'm not sure if Grotendieck was a little bit jealous that it was Mumford who he constructed MG. But in any case, uh, Mumford and then also, uh, of course, Michael Artin completed the construction of MG. So it, people realized that if you want to study more general moduli problems, you have to extend the concept of algebraic variety or of schemes. And this led Michael Artin a little bit later to the concept of algebraic spaces. which is a generalization of algebraic varieties. I'm not going to define them. And then came De Lin and Mumford again and defined stacks. So stacks are still more general concepts extending the notion of algebraic varieties. And they form a convenient language and framework to talk about quotients of varieties by groups if the group action is not as nice as you want. OK, so here, to summarize, we start with Riemann. Riemann makes the big breakthrough, proposes a problem, and many people jump on it. Klein, who takes up uh, the idea and tries to, to make them more precise of Riemann, and then uh, the the next important step by Teichmüller. No? Teichmüller, of course, more on the topological side, but again, very influential, even though the techniques Mumford is using are kind of disjoint of Teichmüller's techniques. And so you could say Teichmüller is the analytic part, the transcendental part, and Mumford, Delin, and Grotendieck are on the algebraic side. Okay? Very good. So that's a little bit about the history. And I really recommend you to look at this article of G. There are many more details, many more anecdotes, but I keep it like this. OK, so I will make a five minutes break, and then we continue. And I want to give you, I already started to give you the abstract definition of moduli, but I want to repeat everything to keep it uh, together and to have a precise definition and starting point. So let us stop for just five minutes. OK, I think we can continue. Now we change a little bit the, the viewpoint, and we come to the abstract definition of moduli spaces. Now. When I started three weeks ago with this definition, I tried to do it on a categorical uh, level. I decided now to, to be more concrete. So I will talk about categories, but I will always take very special categories. So the situation, we just consider four different categories. My notation is also changing a little bit. Let C be one of the four 
categories. So either you take topological spaces and continuous maps, So that's maybe not so interesting for the moment because it's too general. We could take real differentiable manifolds and differentiable maps. We could take complex analytic manifolds and holomorphic maps. Or we could take algebraic varieties, and I will restrict to complex algebraic varieties. And now it depends a little bit what you want to do. You take either polynomial maps. Let me just call them polynomial maps or rational maps. So <clears throat> let me call these maps just algebraic maps. So they are given either by polynomials or quotients of polynomials. And then, if you want, you could also take here schemes. Let's say schemes of finite type. Or you could just take, if you want to take, so these are not four, so here. These are my four preferred categories. You could also take uh, any category, any C, for those who like to work functorially, any C with fiber products. Products and a terminal or initial object. But I'm not going to consider this here. So maybe you just think of topological spaces. We define, as we already did, a family in C. And this, I repeat. This was defined for the first time by Teichmüller. A family in C oops, is a map. Okay. Is a map. And now if I say map x to t f, then I mean continuous differentiable holomorphic or algebraic. <clears throat> with base space t. This would be, in some sense, a time or parameter space. And fibers ft inverse f, sorry, f inverse of t, which I will denote by xt inside x. OK. So just any family in this category, often we want the fibers to be of a special type if, let me call it now, p is a specific class of objects in C. So we want our fibers maybe to be compact. If we are in the topological setting, compact, connected, or maybe simply connected topological spaces. Or you could think of maybe <coughs> differentiable surfaces, real surfaces. Or complex analytic, complex compact uh, analytic or algebraic curves, something like this. 
So in this situation, we will require that xt belongs to this class for all t in t. And then we call it a family in t, a family of objects in P. Now, of course, it depends very much what kind of object you're looking at. If you have manifolds, abstract manifolds, uh, you have to use the concept of differential geometry to define here a map between x and t, which will be also two complex or real manifolds. In the algebraic setting, you have always the help of equations. So what you should think of, think of equations whose coefficients vary with t in t. And this variation can be just continuous, or it could be analytic, or it could be real differentiable, or it could be polynomial. Okay. So <clears throat> now this, you could think of x as a disjoint union of xt, t and t fibers, and uh, nearby fibers will look similarly. So I give you a very naive picture. Let us just take. Uh, we had this, the group action behind. Let us just take the vertical projection where the fibers are these vertical segments. Of course, they, are, they look very much the same. Okay, So we have here, we have t. The whole space is x, and here we have xt. Okay. So this would be now our real interval t, and the map is going down here. Of course, this is just a schematic picture. Now, but in this picture, you can already, you can already explain very well what it means to have a, a, a coarse moduli space. So what is the, the point here? Of course, in this picture, the interval would would parametrize all these vertical segments. Now, for each t, you have one segment. Now, one thing what you want to do is imagine that you have here t moving by some function. So t uh, is given as a, I don't know, you, you have a point moving here around. Uh, one problem which is crucial in this context is the following. For each value of t, you may want to choose an element in the fiber. And you see, whenever you move t, this could jump arbitrarily. So that's something you don't want. Uh, the existence of sections, so let me write this down, section, means the following that whenever you move in the parameter space, you want to find here something which looks like a continuous or analytic or algebraic curve, selecting in each fiber one point in a very nice way, okay, without discontinuities. This will be one of the basic concepts when we study the moduli problem for families. I'll come back to this in a moment. okay. So in here we have the concept of family for any of these categories. In algebraic geometry, you impose often an extra condition. Maybe I can write this here. In algebraic geometry, you want that the fibers are even uh, more similar to each other as in general families, and this is a concept of flatness. Require the map f to be flat. 
So flatness is a magic word. Many people are afraid of, of flatness, but it just means a stronger continuity property of fibers. If you want, I can give more details about flatness maybe later on. Okay. So what I want to say is that often you look at these families either with additional properties or with extra data. Often you require in the family that you also have given sections. Yeah, yeah. So now I, I think I, I have to erase. So when, when you want to have marked points on the fibers, as we will do uh, later on, then you say a family is not just a map like this, but it comes with sections. So all kind of additional stuff is possible. There is no, no most general definition. So in, when we take these four categories, we have, of course, the notion of equivalence. So remark the equivalence between objects in P is given by isomorphisms. in C. So this would mean in the topological settings, this is homeomorphisms. In the real differentiable settings, this will be diffeomorphisms. In the complex analytic settings, this will be biholomorphic maps. And in the algebraic settings, this will be either biregular or birational morphisms or maps. Okay, So we will only restrict now to this type of equivalence relations and not talk about more general group actions. Okay. So once we are there, we need one more concept, which is the pullback of a family definition. If x to t f is a family in C, or let's say in P and C, because we need both. And I don't know, we can call it phi, from S to T is a map in C. We get, so we have the following diagram, x to t. Now, I'm not sure if everybody is familiar with fiber products. You take the Cartesian product of x with s. But inside this Cartesian product, you take only those pairs of points x and points in s, which are mapped under f and phi to the same element. So that's what you express here as a Cartesian diagram. So what does this mean in the simplest example? So this here, this g here, will be called the pullback of f via phi. Typical example, s is a subset of t. If s is a subset of t, this is just the restriction of f over s. Example s a subset of t, then we get the restriction of f to s. And if s is just a point, then we just get the fiber over s. 
Okay, but you have more general situations. Now there's a a technical problem. Uh, not in all categories, fiber products exist. So in the category of topological spaces, you have no problem. But in the in the category of manifolds, the fiber product need not be a manifold. It could be just it could have singularities. So <clears throat> make sure that x times s over t is again in C. So you may have to impose extra conditions to ensure this. Okay. But if you think of algebraic varieties, there is no problem. Yeah, you get the fiber product. So let me write this here. This is just as a set, this is x and s, f of x equals phi of s. So it is given by equations in the Cartesian product. Okay, that's the pullback. Uh, maybe I give you an example because I'm not sure if everybody is so familiar with this concept. Let me consider a, a family of curves parameterized by the complex numbers. What I'm telling you today overlaps to a certain extent what I already told you, but I think it's good to, to repeat it and to keep it clear. So imagine that capital X is given by f t x y equals 0, or maybe z equals 0 in C3, and f is a polynomial. So x t, let me write t0, will be given by f of t0 x y equals 0. So this will be now in t0 c2, which I identify with c2. And so <clears throat> t may be in t equals c. And what shall we take for phi? Take phi. Let us take for s again c. And let us map by setting s to s quadrat, s square minus s. And then the fibers xs, maybe I should not call this, let me, <coughs> is that not a good name? I'm sorry. So what will be x times s over t, it will be defined by, now this is, now the parameter is s, and it will be just f s square minus s x y equals 0. Okay? So you see, it's just a, a change of parameters. You substitute your parameter by a polynomial in s. Okay? That's what you have to think of as a pullback. One more definition, equivalence of families. If now let me draw, let me take two families, y over t are two families in C, call them Again, there's a notion of equivalence, equivalent or isomorphic. If you have a commutative trigram, so there exists some phi in isomorphism in your category over t. So let me call this f, this here g, 
f and g. What does this mean? So you have a, in the topological category, you will have a homomorphism between the two, or you have in the, for manifold, a diffeomorphism or a biholomorphic map or a biregular map. But meaning over t means that the fibers are sent to fibers. So phi, if you restrict it to xt, then you will end up in yt for all t. Yeah, this means that this diagram commutes. Think of vector bundles. Yeah? In vector bundles, so the fibers will be vector spaces, and you require that these, these vector spaces are sent to the analogous vector spaces in Y, and you require moreover that the map phi restricted to the fiber is linear. Okay? So <clears throat> you have all type of variations of this topic. OK, so what is my time? I have some 10 minutes left. And I want to, I'm not going to finish today, but that's not a problem. So as I already mentioned several times, Grotendieck insisted very much in moduli problems to think of families. Today we learned that this is actually already uh, an idea or a, a philosophy shared by Teichmüller, yeah, that you always think of families. So probably I won't have time today to give you all the definitions, but let me make a couple of remarks because they are uh, not very difficult, but nevertheless important. So remarks. So if f from x to t is a family of objects in P. Let me just write inside C. Yeah? The objects are contained. Uh, <clears throat> then, as I already said, we get a map O. The notation has slightly changed from t to p. And how does this work? Uh, you just send t to the fiber. Now p, a priori, is just a set of objects. Yeah? But later on, we will equip it with a topology or with the structure of an analytic manifold. Okay. Now, this, I think I mentioned this already. Now, if M is a set of equivalence classes of objects in P, we similarly get which I call now mf, I think. Yes, mf from t to m. Sending t, now I denote the equivalence class by xt. This is the equivalence class of xt. OK. And uh, if m has some topological analytic structure, we will want that this mf is continuous. So expect, once you talk of a space, if m is really a space in the sense of a topological space or a manifold, mf to be a map in C. And this, of course, can only be a map in C if m itself is an object of C. 
provided m is in C. Okay, so this was really a big struggle, yeah, to realize these parameters as a space and to talk of them as a space and with a certain dimension. Okay. <clears throat> so, number three, this is a certain uniqueness property may require that this m of f is different from m of g. f and g are now two families as before. Whenever the families f and g, now we assume that they are with the same base, are not isomorphic or not equivalent. This is an extra condition. Here we want to, we want that our map to the modular space really distinguishes uh, families which are not equivalent. It, it should not send everything to the same, to the same element in M. And the uh, last condition, and these are already implicitly the conditions we impose on a modular space. Uh, additionally. we may ask that every map, and now we go opposite. We start with from t to m, t to m. m is our ideal modular space. We don't know yet how it looks like. And of course, this if I say every map, I mean in C. So recall, the object of the point of m will be later on equivalence classes of our objects in P. Okay? So we may require that every map as such uh, stems from a family F X T. So let me call this here mu. So what do we want? We want that mu is actually mf for some f in c. That's precisely what I, I have drawn here with these vertical segments. No? If you have, if you have a, a map from t to your space of moduli, so this is here the parameters, you want to find for each value, so for each mu of t, this is a point in m, you want to find an xt, want to find xt in p. That, of course, does it, it exists, but you want to find it in a way such that if you define x as the disjoint union of these xt, and you go down to t, is a map in C. You see the point? That's a highly non-trivial problem. Yeah. So as this, think of topological spaces. This mu here, it just continues. No? So you get inside m, you get a something continuous, a continuous path in M. And each point of this path corresponds to an equivalence class. And now you select for each mu of t, you select one such xt. But there is no rule how you select this xt. There are many objects in the equivalence class corresponding to mu of t. And it is not clear that if you choose this xt arbitrarily, that if you take the disjoint union, that you get an object which is, again, a reasonable topological space or a manifold. Okay? You cannot just, of course, you can take the disjoint union as a set, 
but you want to he have this in C, okay? This space here. So you have to choose your xt in a nice way, okay? And moreover, such that going down is again a map in C, continuous, differentiable, holomorphic, or algebraic, okay? So I think my time is over. I will continue next week with the concept of universal family. That's something we already have seen. And then we will define properly again fine moduli spaces, coarse moduli spaces. And then I think I also give you the completely abstract functorial definition where you talk about the representability of a functor. Okay. Uh, that's not really central to what we are going to do uh, later on. But I think it's nice to see also this uh, categorical viewpoint. So I think I need at least half a session next week to, to finish this material about abstract moduli spaces. And then we will jump directly on our endpoints in P1 and do whatever we want. Okay? So this will then be a completely switch. And you have seen already in the lecture I gave last Thursday where we are going. So sorry for the complications at the beginning of today. And thank you for joining. And have a wonderful evening or afternoon. And see you next week. Bye-bye.